Good morning and welcome to our Westwood online worship service. And again, just so glad that you've joined us uh, this Sunday morning. Um, I want to thank our worship team also just for the, the work that they continue to do and, and the development of our online platform and, and seeking to be as effective as, as possible. I want to thank all you folks who are doing such a great job. Thanks also to, um, to Adriana and Joy uh, for leading us this morning and giving us a little bit of a peek into uh, their lives as uh, young adults and university students in these crazy days. Of course, Adriana is our oldest daughter, and uh, Joy uh, Lowen, we've known her since she was a little baby. And so i uh, been great friends with uh, her family for many years, and it's been awesome to have her live with us as uh, she studies nursing up here with Adriana and uh, so many of uh, other young adults uh, in our city and the north. So thank you so much. Um, I want to thank uh, our congregation, too, for engaging in this uh, last week's week of prayer. Um, I, I trust that you are growing in your, uh, your prayer lives and in your practice of prayer and your understanding of prayer. Um, I want to thank our pastoral staff who contributed to uh, some of the resources in, in guiding us through the week and giving us uh, resources in how to pray and how we can apply it in greater measure. It's greatly appreciated, and as a church family, we, we desire to be people who truly are uh, men and women, younger and old alike, who are uh, growing in our understanding and our practice of prayer. Well, in our sermon series, uh, Be the Church, we're, we're making our way through the book of Acts, and um, obviously we're not covering everything that we could cover in the book of Acts. It might be here a little longer than maybe all of us would like to be, but uh, we're trying to cover the central aspects, like the, the most foundational pieces of what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be the church. Um, I, I guess I could have called this, this sermon series, The Church Has Left the Building, uh, because that's in fact what has happened. But, but I pray that more than anything, as we work through the book of Acts, it's going to help us to grow in our followership of Jesus as, as his disciples living in this world being the church. Um, this morning, uh, we're in Acts chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there. And the big idea on which I want to focus this morning is the importance of hardship and the Christian life. Hardship and and the Christian life. Yes, those two uh, phrases are going to go together. And you might do one of two things at this point. Um, you may turn your TV or your computer off, or you might lean in a little bit closer to see what, in fact, the Bible has to say about hardship in the Christian life. Because who who wants a life of hardship? Who wants suffering? Who wants challenge and tough stuff in our lives? I certainly don't. I, I certainly don't welcome it. But, but what, if, what if, in fact, hardship was a requirement for your growth as a disciple of Jesus? Would you still want to follow him? You know, the early church... Um, that we've been tracking as we've been looking at the, the book of Acts, it teaches so many core elements about, about walking with Jesus. And a lot of these qualities that we've been talking about over these last number of months are, are really popular and they're elevated in contemporary church culture. Um, our younger generations really resonate with, with the early church in Acts because of the earthiness, because of the authentic faith that we see uh, in the early church. So, you know, we look at the early church and we see their bold witness for Jesus. Like they are, they are out there, they are just, you know, giving it their all, they lived it. Um, we're drawn to their warm hospitality where, where people would um, warmly care for one another, welcome each other in their homes, and, and care for one another as brothers and, and sisters in, in, in faith. A wonderful quality which we actually resonate greatly with. Um, the early church expressed a generosity which was absolutely astounding. They would sell their possessions, they would sell land, and then they would take the proceeds and they would give it uh, to people who had need. Like, that's absolutely amazing. They were known as people of fervent prayer. We even talked about that last Sunday. They would ask God 
to work miracles in the lives of people, and they often witnessed God doing amazing things. Um, and all of these qualities of, of this early church were a growing part of their lives as these, these people learned to follow Jesus and to be the church. And we would heartily say amen to each of these qualities. But what about hardship? Would we also embrace hardship in the same way that we like these other qualities as a desired quality to mark our lives as Jesus followers. Like, what if, what if there were expectations of following Jesus that were discouraging and uncomfortable for you? Where you had to take the desires of your heart and you had to deny those desires because you know that those desires are not the pathway towards Jesus and his word to us is clear about it. Would you still be interested in following him if that became a part of your life? Because in some respects, it would be a hardship. Or what if you knew that your friends would make fun of you at school or ostracize you for your faith in Jesus? Would you still want to follow Jesus? What if you knew that your economic circumstances would always be marginal? Super challenging, wondering if the bills are ever going to get paid, if there was ever going to be any kind of tangible benefit in following Jesus. Would, would you still be interested? Or if you knew that your marriage would be significantly altered because you are choosing to follow Jesus, but your spouse is not so interested, would you still want to hang tight to Jesus? If you knew that prolonged sickness or, or family tragedy or estranged children would be a part of the discipleship program that, that Jesus has for you to transform you into the follower that he desires, would you sign up? Like that might make it for a good lunch conversation today. And in this story, in Acts chapter 14, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul taught brand new disciples who had come to faith in Jesus Christ and formed the early church. Paul said to them, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. But Paul didn't teach them that they would become healthy and wealthy. Paul didn't teach them that their marriages and their family and their employment would be amazing and that they would finally get the life that they always wanted. No, Paul said that we must go through many hardships to, to enter the kingdom of God, to follow the way of Jesus, to, to uh, embrace the values that Jesus uh, embraces and to live those out. And I want you to notice those two words, must and many. Do you, do you see them? You might want to circle them or underline them in your, your Bible. Because you, you read that and it kind of sounds like hardship and suffering is either a prerequisite for following Jesus or hardship and suffering is a natural outcome of walking with Jesus. But either way, it doesn't sound awesome. I think other cultures know this far better than ours in the West, but we definitely don't talk about this a lot or teach on it enough, from my perspective, about this uncomfortable reality that following Jesus and hardship go hand in hand. We, we want to run from hardship. We seek to deny it. We get frustrated or disillusioned when it confronts us, because we cannot understand why this terrible thing is happening to me. We want to be bold witnesses. We welcome warm hospitality. We want to be known as generous people. We want to be people who are fervent in prayer. Absolutely. But the early church was also taught that hardship is a part of the deal when you say yes to following Jesus. So what's the story behind this? Well, this is Paul's first missionary journey of three missionary journeys that are recorded in the scriptures. And, and Paul's practice 
when he would go on these journeys, was to go to the Jewish synagogues and engage the religious leaders in uh, discussions about the Old Testament. That's where he would start. And then he would move the conversation to Jesus, who uh, he described and explained was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And so as they would discuss and debate, sometimes uh, he was received well, but more often than not, the religious leaders got very angry with him. They would stir up the crowd against these disciples, and they would often incite physical violence. This is where the story begins in Acts chapter 14, verse 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. So this is the the third stop of the missions trip in this first missionary journey. And so far, they're three for three. Three cities, And in each one, they receive severe opposition. And in Iconium, we're told that there's a plan to stone them. So how many of us would have long packed up the kids and headed back home to the good life where we don't have to deal with that kind of hardship? Probably most of us, if not all. Well, not Paul and Barnabas. They move on to the next city, Lystra, where they miraculously heal a crippled from birth. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So at first, Paul and Barnabas and the rest of the disciples, these missionaries, they're they're a real hit with the crowd. A crippled man is is able to walk, uh, so a miracle takes place. Everyone goes wild, starts to celebrate. But what Paul and Barnabas don't realize is that they're being viewed as Greek gods and the people are starting to worship them, but they don't actually understand this. They don't realize this right away because they don't speak the language of this city. And while this is all going on around them, guess who comes walking up the street? The same guys who were giving Paul and Barnabas trouble in Iconium had banded together, had made their way 20 miles up the road to rile up the crowd in Lystra, and they won the crowd over. This time, their plot worked. Verse 19, they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. Now, do not skip over this. Normally, there was a place outside the city gates for public stoning. Paul was actually stoned inside the city gates because these guys were so angry with him that they could not wait until they got outside beyond the city walls. Instead, they stoned him right on the spot where he's standing. But not only did they stone Paul inside the city, they assumed that they were dragging a lifeless corpse from the city to be tossed on the garbage pile outside the city gate. So this this is not a pleasant scene. Like everyone thought that Paul was dead. 
And maybe he was. This could very well be a miraculous event that happens here. We don't know for sure. But everyone thought that he was, was dead. Because when a person has had stones thrown at them until they are unconscious, to the point where everyone does believe that they're dead, and these guys, for the record, they're actually pretty good at what they do. They stone people with some regularity. Um, what do you suppose a person who's received this kind of treatment looks like? How about dead? Bruises, bumps, lumps, blood, broken bones, no movement, lifeless, and then dragged on the ground to the garbage dump. Like, doesn't it surprise you a little bit that in writing this account, Luke is rather vague? Luke is a doctor. He's a historian. You'd actually think that he'd have something to say about this, right? But look what he says. But after the disciples had gathered around him, Paul, in his dead state, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Like, can you, can you imagine one moment everyone thinks that Paul is dead and the next he gets up and then the following day he heads back to work. Like, this is absolutely crazy stuff. And guess what Paul does? Does he run back home? Does he walk away? Does he steer clear of the hardship, the inevitable hardship that's going to continue? No. He heads back into the city from where he was just beaten, and then he goes to the other cities who had ridiculed and opposed him, and at each place, Paul and Barnabas did not teach the new disciples that their lives would be easy, but rather that they must experience many hardships to follow Jesus. And as they taught those believers, the Bible says that those people, the, the early church, was strengthened and encouraged in their faith. They were, um, they were directed to continue to persevere in their faith. And when I read this story and I reflect on my, my own life and my own ministry, I ask myself, who am I to preach on this? Like, who, who are you, Rob, to, to know anything, to have any insight about a story like this? What do I have to say about the importance of hardship in my life as a disciple of Jesus? I know other people who probably know a whole lot more than I do when it comes to persecution and difficulties for our faith. And if hardship is, is just about getting beat up for, for preaching in front of a crowd who doesn't like what I have to say, well, then it's true. I, I have nothing to offer. I've had people leave and never come back. That's true. I've had lots of people disagree uh, with what I had to say because uh, God's Word, the Bible, which we say is authoritative for our life and faith, it does cut deep, it does challenge, it's, it's going to make many people um, just kind of walk away. One time, a man stood up in the congregation that I was serving and, and angrily challenged what I was saying. Thankfully, our elders stepped in and, and were able to kind of usher him to the back and have a word with him, but, but that's about it. So, so my pastoral experiences don't measure up to any degree with Paul's. But, but when Paul says that disciples must go through many hardships, he's actually not referring just to that terrible beating that he had just experienced. He's actually referring to many different kinds of challenges and trials that come in life that make us wonder if we should still follow Jesus. Read 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, Paul describes so much more of his life. 
Sometimes Paul describes himself as struggling because he was a nomad, wondering um, if he would ever have permanent roots. No significant friends with which to share life. Hardship. And he talks about it. Sometimes his hardships involve people who claim to be fellow disciples, fellow believers, uh, brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ, in the local church. And yet they made his life miserable as they gossiped about him and as they spoke falsehoods about him. Hardship. Sometimes he felt like an absolute walking zombie because he never got any sleep. There was always one more thing to do. There was never enough time to do it. Hardship. Sometimes Paul didn't have enough money to buy food or clothes or shelter over his head. Hardship. Sometimes he had incredible amounts of pressure placed on him to help pastor all these churches that he was planting. Hardship. Well, now when we think about the many hardships that disciples of Jesus must walk through, well, now we can relate. The hardships we face as as human beings and disciples of Jesus are many, and they're varied, and they challenge our faith in Jesus, and they cause us to sometimes ask the question, is it worth it? Should I still keep walking with Jesus? The things that weigh us down in life and and keep us awake at nights. The unexpected diagnosis that's terminal. The death of a loved one. The job insecurity. The empty bank account. The marriage breakdown. The wayward children. The infertility. The bankruptcy. The loneliness. The anxiety. The the depression that does not want to lift. Not being able to visit elderly parents several provinces away who are locked down in their home. All the things that we wish we could just have dissipate, disappear from our life, yet they are a part of us. They've become a part of us even as disciples of Jesus. Paul says, We must go through many trials as we walk with Jesus. A few years ago, not too long ago, I found myself walking through a really difficult season of ministry. One with hardship that I had never experienced before. And quite frankly, I didn't know what to make of it. I I guess I thought I was somehow immune to the attacks of the enemy. or, Or maybe I was just a little blind to the attacks of the enemy. And as I stumbled through that difficult time, I was asking myself these questions. Like, what's going on? Why why is this happening to me? I I don't deserve this. I wonder if Paul sometimes asked those questions because he certainly had every reason to do so. And one day, I was reading through 1 Peter And I landed on Peter's words, which became a part of my journaling throughout that season. And Peter's words totally captured me. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Don't consider it strange when tough times come. Those those words totally captured me. Now, confession time from your pastor. When I began in pastoral ministry as a 23-year-old, I confess that I imagined, remember this was before, kind of as I was beginning, I imagined ministry was sitting behind some nice big desk and preparing clean, tidy sermons, wearing a a double-breasted suit, so a little bit of an era kind of uh, note there, And, and on Sunday mornings I would greet people who had enjoyed a pleasant week Um, One that was free from hardship and suffering. Because as long as you're walking with Jesus, as long as you know Jesus, everything's going to be just fine, right? Well, 
many of your stories would paint a very different picture. Thankfully, by God's grace, my perspective has also changed, which tells me that I'm maturing as a disciple, praise God. Yet, at the same time, I thought it strange that I would walk through such a challenging season as a pastor. I now know and I understand more fully that Jesus wanted to use that experience to refine me, to test me, to test my obedience, to test my perseverance, to test my trust in him, to grow me as a leader and pastor. Growth that may never have come unless I walked through that fiery ordeal. But let's not pretend and make no mistake. It was not pleasant at the time. Hardship rarely is. So how does this story in Acts 14 encourage and challenge us in our walk with Jesus? To be growing, maturing disciples of Jesus, to truly be the church no matter what comes. Well, if you're experiencing difficulty and hardship in your life as a follower of Jesus, even now, and you can identify what that issue is right now, you are in fact normal. Why? Because Paul said you must walk through many difficulties as a disciple of Jesus. Unlike what is often taught and lived in in Western, uh, in the Western world and in church in the Western world, Jesus says in this world, you will have trouble. He's saying this to his disciples. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So if you, if you are faced with a challenging uh, chapter or season in your life right now, you may actually be in, in the very place that God desires for you to be as he shapes you as his disciple. Now I recognize that sometimes Hardship and suffering is a part of one's life because of, of disobedience. And we're not, we're not uh, listening to what God's Spirit is saying to us, or we're walking away from what God's Word has already directed us to do. But don't be misled. The gospel of Jesus is not one of health and wealth. The way of Jesus is one where following Him in obedience and in hardship, can actually coexist together. Paul, again, in in Romans, he writes this. He says, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. One of the products of suffering is hope. Ultimately, hope in Jesus who redeems and restores and will one day make all things new. So don't don't make the mistake that I did and think that something strange when tough stuff comes. The real question is how we're going to respond when it confronts us. Now you might be watching today and And you're saying, I I can't relate. I don't have hardships in my life. I don't have struggles. I I have a job, and and I have a home, and I have money in the bank. My family is intact. They're doing well. Everyone is healthy. I don't struggle with faith questions. So, So I guess this message isn't for me. Really? Do you remember those two words that that Paul used to instruct the early church about what it means to follow him. Must and many. If you're thinking that you got off easy today, thanking God for your great life, maybe you need to reevaluate your life from another perspective. So let me ask you this. Have you knowingly avoided difficulty? You probably weren't expecting a question like that 
in a sermon like this? Have you knowingly avoided difficulty? Do, do you know that a disciple can be disobedient to something that the Lord ha- has wanted to do in their life, but it looked too difficult, so they opted out. They opted for the easy way, which in the end may be more comfortable, but it's not going to help you to live out the kingdom of God. You know, the first church that ever expressed interest in me to serve as their youth pastor after I graduated from Bible college was in Smithers in 1993. I was so freaked out at the thought of moving to the middle of nowhere that I I did the Jonah and I ran the other way. It seemed like too big of an ask from God. Like, leave my family, leave my friends, leave everything that I knew to serve him in Smithers? No way. Too hard. Thankfully, God gives second chances as we surrender to his leading. You know, if Paul, if Paul had not proclaimed the gospel when it was dangerous to do so, he may as well have just stayed on the couch because for Paul, it was dangerous most of the time. He he would have avoided suffering. He would have avoided hardship, but he would have missed out on the blessing. The blessing of seeing God work in him and through him and through the church. One of our, our four priorities at Westwood is, is bold outreach. Well, who doesn't want to be a bold witness? A quality, a characteristic that's demonstrated in the early church in Acts. We say, yeah, that's, that's what I want to be like. That's what we want to be like as a, as a church. But do you realize that when you commit to being a bold witness, like the folks in Acts in the early church, you need to also prepare for difficulty, for hardship, for tough conversations, for ostracism, for people blowing you off. But with the difficulty also comes the blessing. Paul, again in Romans, now if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Or what about the challenges that emerge in the form of inconveniences? Like when there's somebody in need of help or a visit or an encouraging word or some finances or some food and, and you have that, you can, you can actually help that problem. You may not view it as a personal hardship, but you probably might see it as an inconvenience. And you know what? You can avoid the inconvenience by looking the other way or hoping that somebody else is going to take care of it. But what if Jesus is giving you the opportunity to lose some sleep, to give up some money, to go out of your way, to step out of your comfort zone so that you become more like him? Those two words, must and many. What are you going to do with them? When Paul went back to the churches with those young believers who witnessed personally his hardships, these are the things that he would have been teaching them. Not that their lives would unfold just as they dreamed, but as they walked with Jesus, that it wasn't going to be easy. They would have challenges of many kinds. But in the midst of those challenges, they were to keep their eyes on Jesus. They were to persevere in their faith. And the Bible says that the church was strengthened, built up, bold, stronger, more robust because of these difficulties. Brothers and sisters, difficulty and hardship is a part of following Jesus. While it's challenging, your and my perseverance through it is exactly what Jesus asks of you as you fix your eyes on him. But he's not far off. He's not distant from you. Jesus is actually with us as we walk through it. 
it's awesome to have godly friends who can encourage us and um, who can stand with us, but they may not fully understand what we're going through. Of course, we have the Bible to help us and to read it for comfort. We have prayer, and those things are amazing. But Jesus is actually with us as we walk through our hardship. In the book of Hebrews, this is what we, this is what we read. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. May the grace of Jesus be sufficient for each one of us as we walk through the many hardships, the many trials, the many difficulties that will come our way as followers of Jesus and as a church family at Westwood. Let me pray for us. Loving God, we thank you so much for your word to us, which encourages and challenges in so many ways. It's sharp. It cuts deep. Sometimes we struggle with what it has to say to us. And today, we just embrace the truth that you are with us in our time of need. So, Lord, today I ask that you would go before the person who is right now going through a very, very difficult season in their life. I pray that you and you alone would be their source of comfort and strength. Oh, we pray for the community of faith to gather around them. We pray that your word and your spirit would encourage. But we pray more than anything that your presence would overshadow them. We ask that they would find their comfort in you, that they would persevere, that they would keep their eyes solely fixed on you, and that they would be strengthened in their faith because of it. We pray as a church family that the many trials and, and challenges that we face, even now through these days that we're experiencing as the body of Christ, that you would carry us through and that we would be stronger for it. Lord, the church may have left the building but you haven't left the church. And so today we just, we give you thanks. We pray that you'd guide us and go before us in this day and in the week to come. And for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we're dismissed this morning, if um, you'd like to talk about anything that has been shared today or you'd like to uh, send a note or you have a question about it, please feel free to, um, to email us at the office and, and we'll, we'll connect with you through a phone call or um, an email um, and we'll, a, a meeting. We can do those appropriately. And so we just pray that you would, you would keep your eyes fixed on Jesus in everything that you experienced this week. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a wonderful week. Amen. Through every battle, through every